Good evening. Thanks for being here. Uh, first tonight, hearty, hearty Blair welcome to the young people of Kittatinny back there. Their trusty leader is teacher of environmental science extraordinaire, uh, Dan Chamberlain, who is the dad of our own Gracie. Uh, it's great to have him here. Um, thank you. Uh, also, another thank you to Mr. Evans for making this possible two times. We thought it was four years ago. It turns out to be seven. Okay. <laughs> Whatever that means. Draw your own conclusions. Okay. Dr. David Robinson is a professor in the Department of Geography at Rutgers University and since 91 has served as New Jersey's state climatologist. He earned a bachelor's degree in geology at Dickinson's, Dickinson College. <laughs> These guys are frat boys together. I'm not going any further. No stories. And a doctorate in earth science at Columbia University prior to arriving at Rutgers. His research interests, interests are in applied climate, especially related to New Jersey, and in climate dynamics and change, particularly focused on global snow cover. He is a contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which, by the way, in 2007, I believe, won the Nobel Prize, the whole panel's report. So it's a wonderful award. He's also a contributor to the recent National Climate Assessment and sits on the National Academy of Sciences Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. Dr. Robinson is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, has been named an NOAA Environmental Hero, and is past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. He recently received the Rutgers Presidential Public Service Award. I give you a distinguished guest, Mr. Dr. David Robinson. Thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, good evening, good evening. It's uh, a pleasure to be back here uh, with fellow Dickinsonians and, uh, and others in, in the room. Um, both of, we each have, uh, Mr. Evans and I both love the place so much, he found a wife there, um, that each one of each of our children uh, also have graduated from there. So uh, it's nice, it's wonderful to have these connections that last over the years. And again, it's great to be back here. I checked. It was April 15th, tax day, in 2008, the last time I spoke to the skeptics group. I've been up here visiting uh, Craig uh, since then, of course, but uh, it's, it's really nice to be back. And I have very good memories, so you got a lot laying on you here. Very good memories of last time with wonderful questions that were asked. I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible. You've been in class all day. I ran out of class to come up here today. Um, we don't want to be too late. I'd rather just give you a taste of things, all things climate, and then entertain questions from you, uh, front of the room and those folks in the back. So let's get to some slides. It's going to be a potpourri going through here. Um, I have to start with snow. Now tonight I'm going to be mostly, mostly focusing on my role as state climatologist. Uh, Although, what we're talking about has ramifications far beyond the Garden State. Um, but I'm not going to be talking too much about snow cover, which I do in, term, in my research program, which has get, afforded me wonderful opportunities to publish, uh, gather research grants, and really travel around the world and work with colleagues around there. But tonight, around the world, today I'm going to focus more on state climate. But I have to start with the snow picture. Those are my ski tracks from last Saturday morning. Um, down in Somerset County at my favorite, they call it a golf course most of the year. I call it a ski course um, during the year. So that's like the ninth fairway I was down. Um, and multiple times this wonderfully snowy winter. Um, let's uh, press and already we're stuck. Um, 
pressing that button. I'm not pointing it close enough to there. There we go. All right. You're not going to be here too long. Don't worry. Um, this is just a quick overview. We're going to be going piece by piece through this uh, within the next 30 minutes or so. All right. State Climate Office. What the heck is that? Most every state has one. There's like two that don't. Uh, we'll be hosting the annual meeting of the state climatologists right down here in Cape May uh, later in June. Um, these are weather stations that are maintained by my office. We have close to 60 of them. We're going to have 70 by the end of the year. And every five minutes, we get data via cellular modem um, to our lab and put it out for everyone to see. Uh, literally from High Point Monument to West Cape May. The closest one up here is Pequest Fish Hatchery. Uh, we have another station in Hackettstown. Uh, one in Hope, just after you get the police barracks, just after you come off Route 80. So we're here to gather data, um, not just data the last five minutes, but data from decades, decades, and even centuries in some cases. But you need to turn that into information. And then you work with stakeholders. You work with people who have an applied problem. And you convey some knowledge, and you work with them, and you develop ideas to ultimately make decisions. Now that decision, maybe someone looking at our weather network saying, OK, what coat do I put on my kid in the morning? But during Sandy, it was also the governor sitting with our data coming in. We only had about 10 stations go down for communication issues during the storm at any one time because the cellular system worked, the computer system at Rutgers stayed on diesel generator, uh, and the governor was seeing this information to help make decisions, emergency management official, officials to help make decisions to save lives. Uh, so very proud of that. During the whole storm, we lost one wind instrument down on Long Beach Island. That was it. So we have a very resilient network as well. So that's the State Climate Office here to serve the state in all sorts of questions that have ramifications or relationships to weather and, and climate of the state, be it a, a, a very short-term thing or looking ahead at what may lie into the future with temperatures, precipitation, um, drought, um, sea level change as well. Okay. This is our weather network. We'll just leave it at that. Invite you. You can see some URLs along the way. NJclimate.org, NJweather.org. Come and visit us. Any weather weenies in the audience here? Really get into it? There, there are a few hands. Confess, confess. There. I grew up in Jersey, so I was born and raised on this. I've been keeping weather records in my backyard since I was in fourth grade. And believe it or not, I still do it every night, even though we have all these stations electronically around the state. Uh, it's a wonderful vocation, of course, and an avocation. This is a bunch of volunteers provide data to us every day. Part of Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, COCORAS. I did not make that up. It's part of a national program, and as a matter of fact, very proud to say, one of my close friends who's a state climatologist in Colorado developed this in the High Plains and it's gone even into Canada now. And yesterday, it was announced, no, today's true, yeah, yesterday, he was in the White House and the White House kitchen garden is now a Kokora station, officially. And he put a rain gauge in the White House yesterday and met the president. So this is a really neat program. We have about 250 active volunteers who augment our automated network with measurements. Last Friday of precipitation, rain and melted snow. You can see more fell here, less up your way. And this was the snowfall reported. So there was more precip here, but some of it was rain. Here there was a lot of precipitation and it was cold enough for snow. And you kind of missed out on the heaviest precipitation thus the heaviest of the snow. But this is invaluable information for agricultural purposes, flood forecasting, on and on and on, transportation and so on. Um, so that's the State Climate Office. Uh, the climate system, Climate 101. First of all, what's the difference? Oh, well, weather 
It's the long, it, it, it's the short-term phenomenon. What's happening this week, maybe in the next. And climate's kind of the long-term. But this is a more interesting way to remember it. Climate's your personality, and weather just happens to be your mood at any given time. Um, and boy, has the weather been moody uh, of late. Um, and oh, what did I say at, at dinner? That I'd tell you when spring was going to come? Hmm. Not the next two weeks, I'll tell you that much. Um, we are stuck. No eggs out there, please. I, I didn't bring the news to you. No, we're in a very interesting persistent weather pattern that's given the Northeast a lot of cold and snow the last two winters. And out West, you may be aware that ski resorts around Tahoe are closing for the first time ever in March because they don't have snow and it's been so warm. So the west it's been warm and, and drought-like, in the east it's been cold and snowy, and this pattern has been quite persistent for about 15 months now. We think it's related to sea surface temperatures in the North Pacific, which may be tied into typhoon activity coming out of the tropics in the wet eastern Pacific, so on and so forth. It may have something to do with warming conditions in the Arctic, but all I know is sometimes when something's persisting, you ride the persistence train until you see it change. And we haven't seen the chain yet, change yet. It gave us two cold winters, but it also gave us the most pleasant summer in about a decade last summer. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But the short term, where weather intersects with climate, suggests that we're going to be locked into, on average, colder than normal conditions for the next couple of weeks. Although Thursday might be quite mild. But that's the thing. Weather is that day-to-day mood, but the personality lately has been one of persistent cold with the jet stream, the polar jet stream riding to our south, opening the door to cold air from the north. And until that pattern changes for any long period of time, it's going to stay on the cold side. It doesn't mean spring won't come, but it, it is taking its time. Um, and, and that's kind of what I was talking about just there. Here we are in the middle latitudes squeezed between polar air masses and tropical air masses, and they're always battling it out around us. It changed, that's why the weather changes day to day and week to week and sometimes year to year because of this battle, which is going to win out. And, and that's what makes the middle latitude so volatile and makes us import our weather more than grow our own weather. Oh, uh, uh, well, you just saw a map that we can't go back to, but that's okay, because I can point to it here. Um, this is kind of the, the intersection of seasons here in as well, but the last picture was going to show you that our state, as small as it is, is kind of a microcosm of what goes on here in the northeast and mid-Atlantic. But we are affected along the coast by maritime conditions. Up here in northwest Jersey, we have some elevation and we're a little further from the coast, so it's colder and tends to be snowier. Here in our very unique Pinelands, you can have very cold nights, but often can heat up during the day because the soils are very sandy and they warm readily. Here in the southwest, kind of the banana belt of the state, it's milder, it's lower elevations, it's away from the coast. And that's where our prime agriculture is. And then you got this tweener zone in the Piedmont where it could go one way or the other. So we have quite a microcosm. Here you can see a satellite image on February 3rd of this year. From here, about Route 195 north, it's snow covered. South Jersey didn't have any snow cover. Anybody knows Round Valley Reservoir, it hadn't frozen over yet. That was, that's right there. But you can see this is the 8th of February, and it's much warmer in the southern part of the state, 20 degrees warmer than the north, partly because there was no snow cover here to help refrigerate the air mass. And then look what it was uh, that same day. It was in the 70s down, 60s and 70s down in Virginia. It was in the single digits up in the Adirondacks. So that's that squeeze play, that wonderful intersection of weather and climate that makes things so interesting. And yeah, this spring's so frustrating uh, if you want to get out. Okay, now, 
we're jumping ahead and we're going to jump from that intersection of weather and climate that we've talked about off and on for the next, last 10 minutes and we're going to look more now at climate past, bring it up to present and then talk about what may be going on and what the future may hold. So climate past and present. Point one, climate has changed on all different time frames for tens of thousands and millions of years. Just 20,000 years ago, this campus was right near the front of a major ice sheet that covered most of North America north of here. Uh, the dark blue area saw some ice within the last couple of hundred thousand years, but not 20,000 years ago. So this just totally molded the landscape here. We had a very different climate, and obviously humans weren't roaming the earth too abundantly at that time and weren't even in North America. So this was part of natural variations of the climate system, in this case caused by the way the earth orbits the sun putting it succinctly, and see, so much water from the ocean was locked up on land and ice, you had to go off to the continental shelf to get to the beach in New Jersey, albeit not a very warm beach even in the summer at that time. So the point is, climate has changed naturally on many time scales in the historic, the geologic past. Um, jumping to more recently, we, we just jumped about 20,000 years there. Um, some memorable storms. If you've been along the Jersey Shore, you obviously weren't around for this, but your parents or grandparents might remember this. Ask them about the 62 storm. Um, that's Long Beach Island. Um, Long Beach Island breached from ocean to bay. Boy, that sounds like something familiar in recent years happened along our barrier islands like that. Um, Floyd, I was looking at this slide as I was preparing this talk. None of you remember Floyd. Um, 16 years ago, a major hurricane coming up the coast just doused the state. Uh, this is the Raritan Basin in central New Jersey and New Brunswick um, and a nearby by Brown Brook. Um, major storm events. Um, this is Irene. Now that, for those of you in the north, from the northeast, not just Jersey, but up into New York and New England as well. You may remember the flooding rains of Irene in 2011. We've had a lot of extreme weather events. Um, that's kind of a take home. And then the question is, what does that say about our climate system? Is this the norm or is this, I don't really love the term, a new normal? Stay tuned. Then there was Sandy. I wanted to spend just a little time on that. Obviously, this was something that's just two and a half years ago, not quite two and a half years ago. And again, an intersection of weather and climate. Um, with that storm, you can see the jet stream wiggling and waggling its way across North America. Um, kind of the, this kind of trough is what's been more in the east the last year and a half or two years. Um, and that allows cold air to come down then you had a late season hurricane come out of the Caribbean and start coming up the coast. And normally, that early season dip in the jet could send an early season nor'easter into the northeast, some really nasty weather. And this storm generally would come out of the tropics and get caught up in what we call the westerlies and head out into the North Atlantic. But there was what we call a blocking high system up here in the North Atlantic, which is kind of unusual. And as Sandy tried to come north, that high said, you're not coming here, and it started pushing it towards the coast. This dip in the jet stream with a storm developing along the jet stream helped to pull the storm on shore. And what you had was this rogue storm that merged a dying hurricane was getting wrapped by a developing nor'easter, and it became the monster rogue storm that it was. So you had Sandy, you had a wavy jet stream, you had this blocking high and a deep trough, and all of them conspired in a very interesting way um, to give us a storm. Now climatologically, this was late in the season, but not tremendously unusual, and this deep trough was pretty early in the season, but not unprecedented. But it was the merger of the two that really helped this storm develop, and then, says here, adding insult to injury, if you will, 
were some other factors. One, sea surface temperatures were warmer than average. We had had 22 consecutive months of above normal temperatures in New Jersey before that storm. Unprecedented run of warm weather. That provided more fuel to a dying Sandy, keeping it alive longer than it would have if it was coming up through normal sea, over normal sea surfaces. Um, landfall was close to high tide, bad luck. That added multiple feet onto the storm surge. It was a full moon. That added about a foot onto the storm surge. And then sea level is about a foot higher along the Jersey Shore than it was a century ago. So if that storm had happened a century ago, it wouldn't have been as big. About two-thirds of that sea level rise is due to the ocean's warming and glacial and ice sheets melting, which one could talk with the warming climate of the last century on Earth. The other third of it's because South Jersey is actually sinking, the land is sinking, uh, and that's associated with the loss of the ice sheet to its north 20,000 years ago. It's called glacial isostasy. Uh, well, boy, this isn't a geology class tonight. So what we had was kind of a perfect storm, the perfect conditions to lead to a devastating uh, result. Um, winds gusted near hurricane force or above everywhere in the light and dark blue and up to 90 miles an hour along the coast. A little less windy in South Jersey, we won't get into that now, but up these ways, gusts 60, 70 miles an hour. And wind, does, wind power is not linear to wind speed, it's more exponential. So a 60 mile an hour wind is a lot stronger than a 50 to a 40 mile an hour wind. So thus, the million trees or more that went down in the state and the tremendous surge along the coast, even into Hoboken. This is seawater coming up New York Harbor and flooding Hoboken, turning it into the uh, Venice of New Jersey for a few days. Um, that's a power substation. That's not good. There were 39 power substations flooded um, by storm surges from Sandy, um, by salt water, storm surge water. Believe it or not, Irene, there were 39 power substations flooded by fresh water coming down rivers. Only two of those were flooded both times. So in other words, if Irene floods and Sandy storm surge came at the same time, you would have doubled the number of uh, substations out and power that was out a week or two could have been out, I don't know how long. So there are credible scenarios that this wasn't the worst it could have been. Look at that, the bay meeting the ocean and a little up the coast in, in Manilokin. Um, one of my students foolishly rode out this storm with two feet of water in his one-story house on Long Beach Island. Uh, Doc, you know, I don't know if I'd do that again, you think? Um, he was very fortunate that he, the water did not come up higher, and he took this picture the next day. Um, trees down, talked about that. But now let's jump. That's that intersection of weather and climate that combined to help make Sandy so bad. But let's step back and look over the last 100 years or so and how our climate maybe has been variable or changing around New Jersey. And this is a time series of temperatures from 1895 all the way up, that's 2014, the coolest year in about a decade. Um, these are annual temperatures based on dozens of stations around New Jersey. I should say this mimics very closely what's happened globally. Uh, in the United States and globally over the last century. So you can see even a cool year like last year is warmer than the average temperatures of the last century. Uh, and you can see how many warm years, including 2012, um, which was the warmest on record in New Jersey. New Jersey is getting warmer and it's getting more rapidly so. Um, not last year. We're off to a cold start this year, but we shall see where we go from there. And that's the fact is, every year isn't the same, but the general function is for temperatures to warm. Uh, you have to look at this with a little bit of humor sometimes. Um, 
I was on a panel with a congressional staffer um, from, from, that, from the Hill, and this is the only slide of mine she wanted after <laughs> the talks on the panel. Um, precipitation. Temperatures change, and it's important. It melts, sea, it melts ice, it raises sea level, it, it leads to discomfort uh, and danger health-wise, but what's more important is water. Will we have enough fresh water? You think we're worrying about this now? Eh, passing thoughts. In California, every single day they're worried about it right now with the drought. We haven't had a major drought in over a decade in New Jersey. And you can see in general, precipitation has increased over the last century. But what's even more notable, the variability of precipitation from your driest to your wettest years is much greater in the last several decades than back earlier. More volatility to our weather. There's more energy out there in this system. And with that, more volatility. And thanks in part to Irene, 2011 was the wettest year in over a century in New Jersey. Um, so there we are with wet, uh, persistent wetness, occasional drought, a major drought in the mid-60s, um, but gradually some wetter conditions in New Jersey than we saw in the past, but more volatile, more extreme rain events rather than a lot more smaller events more of our rain, as the National Climate Assessment just found, showed last year, is coming in big pulses rather than just smaller smidgens of rain. Um, sea level. We are a coastal state. Our nation uh, has the majority of people living near the coast. Uh, this is overall global sea level rise. This is what sea level has been doing along the Jersey coast. Yes, it's rising faster along the Jersey coast than overall globally, in part because of our sinking land, in part because of the Gulf Stream patterns offshore that are affecting sea level right at the coast. Uh, so for several reasons, the pace of sea level rise along the Jersey shore exceeds that of the global ocean on average, which isn't a great thing when you're talking about storms and surges and the, the billion dollar tourist industry and the both multiple billion dollars worth of rateables in real estate and such uh, along the Jersey coast. So, we're more than halfway through, don't worry. Um, causes of climate change. Got to sum it up right here. This is what I believe. No, not belief. People ask me if I believe in climate change and no, I say I understand climate change. It's not a real belief system. But I believe this helps explain what's going on out there. And this also is very similar to what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded. First, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the climate is changing. I've only just touched on a little of that tonight. And then you talk about attribution. Well, it's changing, but why? And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that there's a human fingerprint on this and that we're leading to some, not all, but the majority of the change that's been going on in recent decades. We have greenhouse theory. That says if you put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the atmosphere warms. If you don't believe that by humans adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you're going to warm the planet, you need to throw physics out the window. Because this planet would be at about zero degrees Fahrenheit if we didn't have a natural greenhouse. That's about how much energy we get from the sun were it not held near the surface of the earth by our greenhouse atmosphere in the natural world. So what we're doing is just throwing another blanket on the bed. And if you think we can throw another blanket on the bed by increasing greenhouse gases and not warm the planet, you're countering physics. So there's the theory. The observations, they're not perfect, but they're being gathered everywhere ice and snow that I studied. We, I, my snow work, 25 years ago I wrote my first paper on the early melt of snow in the spring and that pattern is still continuing. Um, and we see it in temperature and, and changes in precipitation and so on and so forth. And then we have these climate models, same models that forecast the weather on a day-to-day -day basis are just run differently. 
the same general physics behind them, and they, they can rather credibly predict what the past has looked like in the last century, and they find that only with greenhouse gases can you explain the rising temperatures of the last century. So once you have some confidence in those imperfect, but still very robust models, you then turn the dials and you turn up the carbon dioxide, you change the dust in the atmosphere, and you see what the future might hold. Otherwise, we just have to sit around and wait and see what happens. So the models, so none of them, neither of these are perfect or complete, um, but together with the theory, it's pretty damning evidence that the climate is changing and humans are playing a major role. There's your greenhouse effect. These are some of these sophisticated climate models. If you're into the physics of it, the computer forecasting, the mathematics of it, there's a job for you. Um, always need young, talented individuals. So, what's the future hold? Got to sum it up quickly here, too. This, some of these hold for the globe as a whole, some don't. Let me point out, rising temperatures, the train has left the station. We even have um, a lot of heat held in the oceans right now that if we were start to stop increasing greenhouse gases, the Earth would still continue to warm for several decades. So, temperatures are going to continue to rise. How fast? We don't know completely. Part of that depends on our emissions patterns over the coming decades. Um, so that's steadier increasing precip. That applies to New Jersey, a lot of the middle latitudes and the higher latitudes, but not the subtropics. Um, those areas that are pretty dry today, um, the Arizonas of the world, are going to get drier and are already showing signs of that. Um, meanwhile, the middle and high latitudes somewhat wetter because the atmosphere, when it's warmer, contains more moisture, which leads to more abundant precipitation in those areas. Um, and then all, every suggestion that we're going to see more in terms of extremes. I already said the, the uh, atmosphere and ocean, the whole climate system is kind of pumped up on steroids, if you will, a lot more energy, and with that, um, the outlook for more extremes. And then sea level is destined to continue um, to rise. Um, this just shows some maps that break it down by season, but this says that the warming on average will be greater in the central part of the country and up into the northeast. It will be greater in summer and fall, a little less so in spring. These are model projections. And you know, I have some issues with the models from time to time. I'm an empiricist more than a modeler, but we do work together. And I have some certain faith in what they have to say. Um, and for precipitation, um, you can see overall the blues are a little wetter, the browns are a little drier. But what's interesting here, it looks like our winters will become moister. But look at the summers. Not any, dry, not any moister, maybe even a little drier and hotter. So that could bode um, with, for some trouble with our agriculture. So you can't just look at the annual averages. You want to look at things seasonally in order to get a feel for how things may act and behave and how agriculture and water supplies will um, reside, how they'll sit in the future. Um, extremes. Are we seeing it already? I took these four pictures, well, my son and I were out there four times in a town along the Millstone River in the Raritan Basin. That's Floyd, that's Irene, that's a nor'easter, deposit that rain, that's another nor'easter, that's uh, a, uh, a, um, a light stanchion. Um, there's the overhead light, but there's the light pole with the traffic light. Um, and then we had a flood just in this past May 1st. But when looking back over a century of records of stream flow on this, on this river, the highest flood, the second highest flood, the third, the fifth, uh, excuse me, the sixth, and last spring, the seventh. So four of the seven greatest floods of the last century have been in the last 16 years on this river. And it's not because they're paving over more of the river basin. That contributes some particularly to flash flooding. But this is just too much rain in too short a period of time in that river basin. I can't tell you right now if that's a sign of more extreme weather due to climate variability, climate change. 
Climatologists have to be patient. You have to wait a while to be sure. But it sure is suggestive of a more extreme climate system uh, in action. Um, sea level, my colleagues at Rutgers are doing excellent work on this now. And the best estimate is that by the middle of this century, another foot of sea level rise, maybe three feet by the end of the century. It doesn't seem like much until you read recent reports that Sandy, um, if the sea surge had been a, um, let me see if I got this right, if the surge had been a foot lower, 100,000 fewer people in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area would have been flooded and damage would have been over a billion dollars less. Just from that extra foot, it added that much more to the damage from the storm. So think about raising sea level another foot, or by the end of the century, three feet. Um, I don't think you're going to need shore property here in Warren County, um, but you're going to be in trouble on the barrier islands along the Jersey Shore and ringing the eastern United States. Um, that's a foot rise um, at, at seaside, around seaside heights, three foot rise, that would be completely underwater. And then this is an extreme. I'm not saying this is going to happen anytime soon. You essentially lose your barrier island, and that's without a storm. That's just, that's underwater, period. Okay, impacts of change. I'm not a social scientist. I just want to introduce you to this before I take questions. Um, but the impacts of change. It's multi-sectorial, if you will. Um, the built infrastructure, the agriculture, the health issues, the water resources, and just our plain old natural environment are all impacted and going to continue to be impacted by climate change, be it heat, be it precipitation regimes, be it extremes, be it sea level rise. Um, and, you know, I don't go out and talk to public health groups and tell them what's happening. They tell me what's happening with invasive species coming in, with things wintering over because the winters aren't as cold to kill things off, and so on and so forth. I've been shocked to go to talk to some groups, and I don't have to tell them. They're telling me. And this is a dilemma. I mean, this kind of, you know, you pick out a couple slides, this sums it up. Question is, have they signed a contract, gone to contract yet? So who is the unhappy party here? But this is, that's not even Irene. That was a pretty good flood early in 2011 in the Passaic Basin that people forget because Irene was just gigundo later on. But these are the dilemma people face day to day, personal lives. When you go out and look someday to buy a home, buy property, settle down, um, what are you gonna do? My next door neighbor, she was flooded out in Hoboken in her rental, but she at least was in a basement apartment. She just had a hard time getting out of her apartment, a 20-something-year-old, um, or a homeowner being faced with that. This is, these are the real-world problems we're going to have to address, whether we're into the weather and climate like I am or not. Um, finally, managing climate change. This, this is one preachy, well, first we'll start with this is their plan. Anyway, this, this is kind of finishing up on the preachy side. What do we need to combat this? I guess it's good there's a little pulpit here. Um, we need knowledge. Thanks for coming tonight. I know all of you didn't have to. In your class, you made them come. I know. Um, but, you know, we all need that knowledge. We talked about with the State Climate Office. We need the knowledge so we can make informed decisions as citizens of this state, of this world. Um, mitigation. We need to try to slow the train. I said it's left the station, but I didn't talk about the speed of it. But we're not going to, I've been saying this for 25 years to my classes, we're not going to mitigate our ways out of this. We're going to have to do and undertake adaptive strategies. New York City, they're taking generators out of basements and putting them up at higher levels. Good idea, huh? Um, adaptation. That was a dirty word until recent years, but now people are understanding that we're going to have to have a combination of mitigation and adaptation. And then leadership. Sure. My challenge to you. I sound like I'm a speaker at graduation or something. Um, it's going to take leadership at every level. I've been on national panels, 
state panels. I've spoken to local communities in many times where they have these green energy or these green communities in the state. To, at all levels, we need a, f a leadership. And all you guys can be leaders now or in the future. And with that, I'm going to end with the same slide I showed seven years ago when I ended the talk here. Thanks very much. I know you've had a long day, but I'd be happy to take questions for a while till they pull me off stage. I can talk about this stuff all night. Questions? Yes, sir. What do you think spring will come? I didn't see the 8 to 14 day outlook this afternoon. I was in class, but it's going to take a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to be slow. Um, you know, Yesterday, had it been, yesterday was more like an average January day. And it was very cold because average temperatures have already risen about 15 degrees over what they should be in the dead of winter. So by the time we get to mid April, we still will hit the 60 degree mark, even though maybe we should hit the 70. So I, I give it, it's going to be two weeks until I think we're going to turn the corner and really see things starting to green up and the snow disappearing. But even just, even if it stays below normal, it will still get warm enough to start ridding ourselves of uh, some of the winter uh, doldrums and drying out your sports fields and, and making it a heck of a lot more comfortable out there. But, you know, the good news is, I always try to find a silver lining. You don't want an early spring if you're into agriculture. Four years ago, we were in the 80s in March. It was the warmest March nationally in over a century. Agriculture, fruit trees were three weeks ahead in New Jersey, and we came that close to losing the entire fruit crop for the season on a run-of-the-mill cold March, late March night that wasn't as cold as last night was here on campus because things were so advanced. Now, the fact is, things are slowly blooming, really have hardly started, and by the time they bloom in the middle of April, it's going to be awfully difficult to get that kind of killer cold. So there is a silver lining. I know you guys don't think of it right now. But if you're a blueberry grower, cranberries, or apple peaches in this state, you're kind of glad spring is slowly taking its time. Yes? Despite uh, myself being a so-called weather meeting, my congressman is not, and he continues to reject any <laughs> yeah, um, politics of it. I didn't say, I talked about leadership. You know, when I go out and speak to people, I realize there's people on each end. You know, some of the people who hug those trees a little too tight don't understand some of the uncertainties. But then there's the other side. And I feel they're very difficult to touch. And I try to speak to the vast majority of people in the middle and give them a little information to help them make decisions. Okay, that's the general one. But what do you do to someone with the power of a legislator in Congress? Um, I, I think you just keep pushing the information to them. But more than that, you talk about the consequences of it. And they, that's the door to get into it. If you have to tie it into severe weather, if you have to tie it into the impacts on their community, that's how you get at it. Because you're not going to get that person go right to their face and say, you got it all wrong, here's what's right. These people have egos, these people have intelligence. And that's not how you're going to reach them. So I think you almost have to do an end around and tie it into the severe weather tie it into the impacts on their constituents, and then maybe they'll get the idea. So a question in the back. Yes? Uh, when did New Jersey actually start uh, recording weather accurately? I'm 
still working on that. Um, when did New Jersey start recording weather accurately? The, there was a move afoot in the late 19th century to start putting weather stations around the state. Um, so about 1895, we feel we have enough stations that we can kind of look at a statewide approach. Um, there are some locations that have thermometers back earlier, but they weren't minimum maximum thermometers. They went and read them several times a day. Uh, we, have re we have reports of storms going back um, earlier than that. But good observational records, numerical observational records, only go back 120 years or so. How I wish they went back 1,220 years or so. Um, but that's about it. Now, the satellite era, with what I do looking at satellite imagery of snow cover over areas of the Earth that not many people live or have a ruler to measure the snow, they go back about 50 years at best. So from the satellite records, from remote parts of the Earth and other part within the atmosphere, only goes back about 50 years at best. So we're working with incomplete data, as I suggested earlier. Yes. Yes. Um, how do you feel about Ted Cruz doing his absolute best to cut all funding for Earth Sciences and NASA? And what do you think that is going to hold if he accomplishes his mission? Yeah, the idea about, um, I've heard some people on one side of the aisle say, NASA should go to space. Well, we're part of this galaxy and solar system, aren't we? Um, what I say to them is just that, that we are planet Earth. Planet Mars is interesting, planet Venus, asteroids are interesting, but this is planet Earth. And as far as I know, that's the only place we're living or that there are living creatures, at least in this solar system. So we better learn more about this and not just get this pie in the sky idea that we're only here to look out into space. Um, you know, so I think that's how you twist it there. You, you tie Earth in to the solar system and, and try to convince them that it is critical. And again, you might turn to their constituents. We need to know, is Texas going to get drier? Is Texas going to get hotter? And the answer is yes on both accounts. You know, it's interesting, in Florida they say they're not allowed to mention the word climate change. Um, and there was just a little video I watched yesterday of a state senator in Florida grilling someone from their environmental department, and they, he would not say the words climate change because they feel the governor has directed them not to say it. Um, you know, that's the kind of gamesmanship that's going on right now. We've, we've got to get past that. And the people that say, oh, you used to call it global warming, now you call it climate change. Has anyone heard that? You look at the syllabi of every course I've taught at Rutgers for 25 years, it said climate change, it hasn't said global warming. I'm actually relaxing a little now and will call it global warming because professional surveys by sociologists have suggested that that's a more impactful to call it global warming than to say climate change. Oh, no, I know. I thought climate change was pretty interesting. So we're dealing with far more than just the science here, the politics, the economics and all. And that's what makes it such an interesting, interesting time. I, sometimes I think back to the days 25 years ago when people thought a climatologist mixed drinks or something like that. Um, and people didn't know what it was. Now they do. And you do get hate mail on occasion, and I'm serious. I have colleagues who have gotten death threats. I have not had death threats. But I'm serious. This is real wacky sometimes. Another question. Uh, that's actually what my question was. I was wondering what caused the initial change over from the term uh, global warming to climate change? Nothing. I mean, there just hasn't been a change. I, I, you know, global warming, I always thought, well, it's more than warming because I studied snow cover. Um, so I wanted to talk about it more broadly. I think of climate change, we're talking about precipitation patterns, circulation patterns, sea ice loss. 
uh, ice sheets melting, snow cover regimes changing. Um, it's more than just temperature, and they're not all, some of them are directly associated with temperature. Um, so it really hasn't changed. There's been climate change and global warming. That's just one of those talking points that the other, I don't even want to say the other side, because that's ridiculous. There shouldn't be sides. But some are saying to try to diminish, uh, along with the fact that, oh, the Earth hasn't warmed in 15 years. Well, yeah, but nine of the ten warmest years of the last couple centuries have been within the last decade. Um, and the oceans are warming at a faster pace now than the atmosphere has been warming. And there's reasons to do with ocean-atmosphere circulation to explain that. But sometimes people only want to hear what fits their story best. And that's where scientists don't do well in debates. Because scientists, by nature, are skeptical, work with hypotheses, and test them. And there are, with that, probabilities and uncertainties. Now, that doesn't fly well in a debate with someone who's just darn certain they know what's happening. A couple more questions. Yes, sir? Uh, how do we know that this isn't just cyclical, that the uh, temperature is having just been rising and then going back down? Because millions of years ago, the CO2 levels were much higher than they are now, and then we went into an ice age and came back out, and it's just been flowing back and forth. So how do we know that it's not that it's only something that people are doing, but how do we know that even if we were to stop, that it's not just going to continue? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and as I said when I showed the first slide of the ice sheets, Climate has changed remarkably through time, and actually this last couple million years with ice on land in the Antarctic and Greenland and occasionally North America and Eurasia is very unusual geologically. Most of the Earth's history, there has not been ice on the uh, covering most of the Earth or any of the Earth. So what we, what we turn to with the CO2 today and the emissions uh, from fossil fuels is the rate at which it's occurring. It's occurring at a very, very fast pace that is unprecedented and from what we can see in the geologic record. Um, and, and we have levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now higher than in the last uh, 800,000 years at least. Um, and, and then there's evidence that suggests that at times, as the Earth is cooled for other reasons, the carbon dioxide has changed in response to that cooling or warming. Here we see the carbon dioxide leading the way as it increases, as greenhouse gases increase and they retain more heat in the atmosphere. So it's the pace of what's, where, how it's occurring and it's the fingerprint on how, where it's occurring and, and, and how it's occurring um, that gives us reason to believe that it is a human impact and that if we're going to wait for something naturally to counter it, we may have to wait tens of thousands of years. We've been in an interglacial for about 10,000 years, and over the last million years, interglacials have lasted about 10,000 years. So that means we should start slowly over the next 90,000 years sliding into a new glacial period. But that's 10,000 years, 90,000 years, not a couple decades. Um, so we're working at different time frames, and uh, that's what makes the immediacy of it so daunting. Dave, maybe we'll have one more question. One more we'll question. Up. One more question. One more question. Um, I, I guess I'm building off the last question. Two more questions. In your department, or do you draw a clear line between the actions of humans and climate change? Do I draw? Because of humans, like, can you say directly that the I can say with some high level of certainty that humans are responsible for the bulk of the change we've seen in the last several decades. And there I turn to climate models. And that's something I didn't answer, include in the last answer. Sometimes we have to look to these climate models, and they've been run and showed, uh, have shown that you can't explain the warmth, just speaking of warming, of the last decades since the 70s 
without bringing the greenhouse gases put into the atmosphere by humans. And these models, by the way, are run with solar variability, with volcanic variability, and even with the dust that humans put into the atmosphere, which counterbalances some of the greenhouse effects. And those models are in lockstep with where the temperatures have gone. When you take away all the anthropogenic effects and run them, they show no temperature changes over the last century. So that's kind of what we, what we look at. You had one too. Oh, yeah. um, there's been like talk in the scientific community over the possibility of if things continue the way they are about getting to a point of no return basically where carbon emissions get to a point where stopping emissions won't do anything and temperatures will just keep rising. From what you've been collecting, um, what do you think about the possibility of this happening and if and when this could end up being a reality? Yeah, another great question. It's the, kind of the tipping point question, if you will. I, I, the mo there, I've yet to see a credible model run through this century that suggests a runaway greenhouse. Um, and that's what makes it so very interesting, the checks and balances we have in the atmosphere. And, and we do feel that, and we don't understand them completely, things like clouds and their role in the climate system. So we think there'll be some of the brakes put on and some feedbacks if it gets too warm and moist, more clouds, clouds reflect solar radiation and so on and so forth. So there's nothing that suggests that we can't slow down the train and keep it from running away. But that's just looking practically over the decades and the rest of the century. Beyond there, I don't think we even are, we're not ready to even touch that yet. But I, there, is, there is hope we can mitigate some of this away um, through um, either the climate system itself serving as a bit of a buffer or mitigative active actions of humans uh, helping to serve as somewhat of a buffer. But uh, we've, got, uh, we've got our work cut out. And in the meantime, we see extremes. We can't say definitively that's caused by climate change, but when you sit back, and as I said, as a climatologist patiently, and look at the big picture, um, that's when the climatologists get concerned. Well, thank you very much.